Good evening. Thank you all so much for being here. It's wonderful to see you all. My name is Leah Frieden. I'm the assistant manager of the Reference and Adult Services Department, and it is truly my pleasure to welcome you to the Fayetteville Public Library this evening. And I'd like to welcome those who are watching at home through live stream as well. Um, before you leave today, please do take a moment to fill out the evaluations that we left for you. Those help us to plan for future programs. And I'd like to say some thank yous before we begin. This event is made possible by the University of Arkansas Program in Creative Writing and Translation, the J. William Fulbright College of Arts and Sciences, the English Department, the Walton Family, uh, Family Foundation, the Fayetteville Public Library, and the James E. and Ellie, Ellen Wadley Roper Professorship in Creative Writing. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Rebecca. How are y'all? Good. The vibe feels good in here. Um, so if you don't know who I am, I'm Rebecca Gale Howe. I'm the new professor in poetry and translation at the MFA program. Um, it, I was just saying outside, it really is my personal paradise to be here with you all. And um, I'm so glad to be with you tonight. And I'm especially excited to welcome Alan Dory Watson to our community as the 2022-2023 Walton Visiting Writer in Translation. Um, I do want to just take a minute. It looks like we mostly have our masks on, but we do have some immunocompromised people with us tonight, so you might just be um, tenderhearted about that. If you want a mask and you don't have one, let us know. We have them in the back. We're happy to bring them to you. Um, so thanks for that. Um, Mostly, I want to give the mic over to Lizzie Fox, who's going to introduce Ellen, but I want to say just a few words. Um, Ellen was my first mentor in literary translation. Um, as those of you who practice it know, uh, literary translation can be a bit scary, um, especially when you're first practicing it, because you understand how impossible it is, and yet how worthy. Um, if literature is the work of saying the unsayable, then how on earth does a person go about saying the unsayable again in <laughs> another language <laughs> for someone else? Many young translators give up. Many writers don't even try. When Ellen taught me how to translate, she taught me how to be both bold and responsible as I face this mystery. And she taught that to me by working right alongside me. Every word, every line, every single book draft, <laughs> she was right there. She was tireless, and she taught me to be tireless, that in this work of connection, we have no time to lose. I know countless writers whose early work was studied by Ellen's sure hand, just as mine was, though she would never tell you about this side of her life because it is never about her. Over the course of her long and lauded career as a poet, translator, director, editor, mentor, Alan Dory Watson has offered the US a lineage of connection that has changed actual lives and stretched across three continents and beyond. She is truly a master of our art. And I, for one, will spend the rest of my days trying to express my gratitude to you, Ellen, for your genius and your ethos, for all that you freely share. So that's my two cents. Please welcome Lizzie Fox to the mic, a translator of Fierce Women herself. Oh my goodness, Rebecca. <laughs> That was beautiful, thank you. Um, well, hello. My name is Lizzie Fox, and I'm a translation student here at the MFA. And I have the pleasure of introducing our Walton visiting writer in translation, Ellen Doré Watson. 
Ellen Doré Watson is the translator of over a dozen books from the Portuguese and the author of five books of poetry. Most recently, Pray Me, Stay Eager, published by Alice James Books, which was praised by the New York Times Book Review as an exuberant collection. Watson was born in New York State and earned both a BA and an MFA from the University of Massachusetts. Alongside her prolific career as a poet and translator, Watson served as the director of the Poetry Center at Smith College for 20 years, followed by three years as Smith's Grace Hazard Conkling Visiting Poet. She has also taught at the Drew University MFA program in poetry and translation and worked for decades as the poetry and translation editor of the Massachusetts Review. Now a contributing editor at the Massachusetts Review, Watson makes her home in central Massachusetts and travels frequently to Philadelphia to see her daughter and young grandson. Among her many honors are a Rona Jaffe Writers Award, a Massachusetts Cultural Council Artists Grant, a National Endowment for the Arts Translation Fellowship, and fellowships to Yaddo and McDowell. Named one of Library Journal's 24 Poets for the 21st Century, her work has appeared in American Poetry Review, Tin House, Orion, Plowshares, and The New Yorker, among other publications. While living in Brazil in the 1980s, Watson came across the work of the lauded Brazilian poet Adélia Prado and became her translator, a relationship which has spanned decades in several publications, including, most recently, The Mystical Rose, a selection of Prado's work published by Blood Axe Books. Prado, named one of Brazil's foremost poets by the Brazilian National Library's Journal of Poetry and the recent recipient of the Griffin Lifetime Achievement Award, writes about faith, the body, and, in Watson's words, the humble, grand, various stuff of daily life. She has been described by Robert Haas as what might seem impossible, a really sexy, mystical, Catholic poet. <laughs> Watson's translations of Prado are sharp, sonically playful, and sensuous. As Watson writes in her introduction to The Mystical Rose, she and Prado share a belief that faith, dream, and emotion are as real as objects, and that truth resides in the body. When translating Prado, then, Watson aims first and foremost to be faithful to the emotions present within the original Portuguese poems, to serve not as a mirror for Prado's words, but as an actor interpreting Prado's text for a new audience. She does this magnificently, as many have pointed out. Jean Valentine called Watson's renderings superbly energetic and natural. Fred Marchant notes that Watson's English is lyrical, yet colloquially beautiful. And Carolyn Forche says, in Ellen Watson's hands, Prado's world arrives in English as if it had never left the Portuguese. Watson's own poetry is musical, prayerful, and deeply attentive. Her work is spiritual, but anti-dogmatic. She holds her subjects lightly. Through the prayer, prayerfulness of her poetry, though, runs a current of playfulness, sonic, linguistic, and thematic. Poems with a frank and tender consideration of mortality bump up gently against poems that giggle at the poet's failings or remark on the croaking of frogs at the start of spring, quote, their farty calls speaking sex. Throughout Watson's work, there is observation, reverence, and awe for the natural world. The poet Mary Oliver wrote that to live, we must pay attention, be astonished, and tell about it. And Watson seems to follow that maxim. As she writes in her poem, not a thing, it's a human wow I'm after. Watson's poetry has been lauded as much as her translation. Of Watson's poetry, Alicia Ostriker says, her language leaps, dives, soars, ricochets, lurches, and reels, fusing the stubbornly instantaneous and the transcendent eternal. Watson's drumming heart and hard-driving mind will keep you moving and moved. 
In response to Watson's most recent collection, Pray Me Stay Eager, Ellen Bass writes, these are wonderful, witty, wise poems in love with language and singing the music of the world with all its pleasures and piquancies, its oddities and tragedies. Publishers Weekly called the book a lively and thoughtful collection. These poems are musical meditations on what cannot be narrated, but must be prayed or sung. Personally, in my very brief acquaintance with Ellen, I've found her to be warm and wise. A few of the other translators and I were fortunate enough to have lunch with her today, and she was a delight answering our many questions with patience, insight, and a touch of irreverent humor. Also, she has really cute glasses. We are very lucky to have here with us, have her here with us tonight, and you're all in for a treat at the reading. Please join me in welcoming Walton visiting writer in translation, Ellen Doré Watson. I don't know if I can read after all of that. <laughs> I've never been um, welcomed so warmly and beautifully. Thank you, both of you and everyone here. Um, Rebecca, I can't even respond to, to what you said, but um, I just have to say thank you. You're, you're the person that brought me here, and um, thank you. And thanks to the U University of Arkansas MFA program um, for bringing me, and Jane for making everything work so well. And um, I've had such a great time all day with translators and wandering the incredibly beautiful campus that I forgot that it was election day. Thank you so much <laughs> for that. We're gonna forget about it again for a little while. Um, so, let's see. Um, yeah, thanks for the weather too, I appreciate that. Um, so I'm gonna read um, some of my own poems first. I wanna give Adelia the last word. I'm gonna read for about 10 minutes my own work and then about twice that of Adelia's work and I'm happy to answer questions and sign books afterward. So, oops, changing glasses. So first, a few poems from Pray Me Stay Eager. And a gulp of water. Pray Me Stay Eager has a number of poems that, um, that are called Field Guide to Abstractions, and then there are odes to various abstractions. It was sort of the spine that came together as I was writing the book. So I'm gonna read the first field guide to abstractions. And every time I mention an abstract, uh, abstraction, you can imagine it's in italic, so there's, they're just peppered through the text. Field guide to abstractions. How to distinguish faith from faithfulness, from loyalty, from blindness, or see the hate in envy? Do you detect a difference between male and female generosity? Field guides are by nature particularly pebbled. Practice makes, etc. But we can't draw awe, so the usual maps and illustrations are out. No topography of misery, no field marks of upper and lower sorrow, no tricolor range of habitat, nothing newsy like the cow killer, aka the velvet ant, dwells in woodland ed ed edges and is really a wasp. So we commandeer birders' categories. Aerialists, risk. Long-legged waders, adventure and hope. Raptors, opportunism. Smaller waders, helpfulness. Swimmers, curiosity and gossip. Note, while the inside cover of birds of the southeast bears a ruler, abstractions will prove difficult to measure. And then I'll read one of the odes, and this is the ode to abstractions. So you'll hear about, um, there are other ones, ode to fear, ode to pleasure, ode to edgelessness, ode to awe. Here's ode to abstractions. Because we can't touch or taste ghosts, but we sense them. Because abstract or not, adoration, sacrifice, 
Many someones are surely intimately inside them now. Because signifiers, even though amorphous. Because amorphous can be solace to the single. Believe me, because alone, low, lowing. The teacher says, we all communicate with abstractions at times. Picture fourth graders working up steam, trying to address courage or deceit. But abstract nouns can't convey things we experience with our senses. Wrong. Say fear, and my stomach plummets. On cue, a tangible raccoon ambles toward the open bulkhead, and I convey displeasure, loudly. Let's say I become a banshee. Oh, the outside, inside. Oh, peripheral vision. He wants to move in, to paw specific jars of tomato sauce off my pantry shelf onto the cellar's cement like last year. Teacher says abstract words mean different things to different people, which I find comforting. The daylilies are impervious, the ones impossible to uproot, leggy and common, like those my ex and I picked on this same muggy rain, in this same muggy rain, just before our wedding, 40 years gone. But that's not why I despise them. They have exactly nada to do with betrayal. Because time, because trees whose branches fling downward instead of thrusting up, are no more sad than my eyes make them. Because today, instead of descending fireworks, my neighbor's willow is hope a tired and trusty skeleton subject to gravity that yet carries us, carries us. Do the right thing, children. Take those abstractions and chew them. Because digestive juices, up, down, and sideways, take barbarity between your teeth, suck a while on mercy, let curiosity populate your gut. Because idiosyncrasy is a species of brave vagrancy, volunteer singledom. Because, oh dear hearts, now is ours. And genuine laughter, even for no reason, is no, never abstract. And then I thought about writing something called No Ode. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with it. It just was an idea in my head. And then I sat down in a dentist chair, <laughs> and um, I wrote this poem. First and last poem ever written for, by me in a dentist chair. Um, it's called No Ode, <clears throat> and that goes right into the text. I was trying to decide what it would be not an ode to, <clears throat> or what I wouldn't write an ode to. No ode to greed, or even need. Wish neither on no one. I'm in the dentist chair, numb to aching, wanting it over, thinking about want. I want, I'll say it, a certain kind, not certain, fame. I want not ease, not in work, but from worry. That means money. I want never to be X'd or wide. I want more old, beautiful stuff and my house cleaned and to see at least one wild creature per day and to stop spilling my wine. I want, I want whiter teeth and a waist again. I want a certain boy from 1967 to think of me and be stirred. Want, 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 won't. Definitely don't want this relentless fine spray up my nose, crook in my neck. Nothing numeric or generic. Nothing more from Della than what she is. Not to be found wanting or need to be right. I want transportation via time, place, taste, to be an ear, give a hand. Grant me modest wishes, occasional lightning, to see in the four-handed dance between drill and suction beauty, to want nothing more from the stars than to stand under them. Okay, one more of these and then a couple of newer poems. And this is a little short one that ends the book or almost ends the book, called Word. Night smell of sweet-aged wood and curtains are a-breathing. Wet palm of wave gentle slaps thigh sand. Not like yesterday's brutal. The ribs of the room with their generous resting places. 
I understand where charity comes from, but clarity? No seams here in the white float of almost sleep. Looking for a word, I've stepped into a boat. I want eager, pray me, astonishment. I'm courting this best of abstractions. It says, look at the fish. So the, the book I'm working on, um, a lot of the poems start in which, like that old convention of serialized things. Um, I, I often find that having a series title, whether they stay or don't with the poems, helps get poems to happen. So some of them end up working. Um, so that's been a sort of way that that book came together. Um, so the first two aren't in which poems, and then I'll read two short in which poems. Science doesn't know why we came down from the trees to walk on our many boned ape feet. Nowadays in shoes and on cement, no less. Science hasn't yet discovered why Ian's neck acts up erratically, even when he's really chill. Baby Benny doesn't want wise. He's just thrilled to stagger here to anywhere reasonably erect. No engineer would make a foot out of 26 individual parts unless to be arboreal, swinging limb to limb to limb as apes do, but down they came with our futures in them. Fossils show eons and eons of tinkering until here we are, spines a precarious mess of cups and saucers stacked vertically one on another, sitting on our bums, tinkering with our hands, forgetting feet entirely until we stagger up ask our twisted vertebrae to take their places, take a step onto one of our evolutionarily modified feet and double over. Evolution does the best it can. We're fine-tuned enough to survive and have sex, but easily hobbled by basketball or just middle age, which is pretty much nothing given the havoc we wreak on nearly every ground we tread. Um, this one is sort of a brief meditation on grief. Um, we all know the various places it comes from, but I wonder about where it goes and how it comes back. Um, how it changes over time. Okay. It's not, never really gone, a big grief, right? But when it comes back after a lot of time, it's maybe a little more gentle, perhaps. So this is called <clears throat> Grief, a Clamor of Colorlessness. An attentive passerby might see the vivid, vivid toll it takes, at which moment it matters if they slow or hasten their pace. Which is worse, the whole world altogether oblivious or regularly weighing in, low-slung clouds making unwitting witnesses of themselves, Fading asters <clears throat> insisting on their asterisks, feathery blossom tips, treetops sharp and startling, the sun screened off, waiting. Years after, invisible and fully ours, our grief ache shines, a polished stone we leave in our shoe. Private, like my password, the would-be name of my almost baby boy, that tiny not-nothing who slipped away, but dances under my fingers daily. <clears throat> okay. In which I am a student of trees. <clears throat> Forget the ravenous flames whose writhing is subtraction. Trees speak of dancing and withstanding, both of which I could stand to study. Ever in danger of splintering, the small self requires bend in her branches. I take her out into this gale of a day to watch the trees supple, their lessons in release, ease in the midst of trouble. Last night I learned our DNA expresses our adaptation to the stress of our ancestors, which, depending, could make us limber or silent lumber or rigid with rage. Today I read about the plasticity of the brain and that the tree's arms are not the only heroes. Roots flex in the underground. 
Me too, please. Okay, one more. Did I leave something out? Yeah, this is the last one of, of mine, and it's called In Which I Do Not Get a Tattoo. Why should a writer write facing a wall instead of a window? And who was it said that? The paintings my windows frame ask for nothing. And while sometimes beauty makes us shy, as does blood, and the many ways there are to be wrong, alone, unsung, it's not unreasonable to mention the many things undone or done in, the slew of seals washing up dead from flu again. And though saying doesn't make it so, nor render us the reason, they're still gone. I remember staring at a woman, staring at her hands in a painting, both of us knowing her desperation was isolated and broadly shared. Like beholding my Ethiopian banana plant the morning after the first hard frost, folded wetly in on itself like a many-winged bat, like a sad, fat prayer, just for a moment the world at its least consoling. And if sometimes a phrase like night vision goggles comes to give me the wilt, bless the author for going on to say their light is Midori green, since the human eye discerns more shades of green than any other color. Knowing this feels like a window, like how music can sometimes carry gently, discernibly from the far hill. Like the tattoo, I can love without getting, a tree with leaves flying off, turning into birds. Okay, so now to change gears, and Lizzie did a great job telling you about Adelia, so I won't spend much time on that. She was born to a blue collar family in the interior of Brazil, and was a dreamer and a reader, and the first to go to college. Um, and she burst onto the scene in her 40s, when the great modernist Carlos Drummond de Andrade had been sent her manuscript, her first manuscript, when she was in her 40s, and famously discared, dis declared in a Rio newspaper, Adelia is lyrical, biblical, existential. She makes poetry as naturally as nature makes weather. And, um, and I was going to quote Bob Haas, and you did it for me. So I'll, I'll stop there and just dive into the poems. That is a great quote. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> this first one is called, so these are poems, oh no, I'm doing the wrong thing. First I'm reading poems from her book. This is the one that came out in England, which has the two books that came out here both together. Um, so I'm gonna read some of these and then at the end I'll read the newest poems. Okay. So this is the poem that convinced me I had found the poet I needed to translate. And it was translated by students going the wrong direction and it was, I just could see even underneath that, that it was the person. Day. The chickens open their beaks in alarm and stop with that knack they have. Immobile, I was going to say immoral, Wattles and coxcombs stark red. Only the arteries quivering in their necks. A woman startled by sex, but delighted. And I thought I had that in the original, but I don't seem to find it. So we'll skip that for now. <clears throat> okay. This one's called Before Names. I don't care about the word, that commonplace. What I want is the grand chaos that spins out syntax, the obscure birthplace of of, otherwise, nevertheless, and how. All those inscrutable crutches I walk on. Who understands language understands God. Whose son is the word. It kills you to understand. Words only hide something deeper, deaf and dumb, something invented to be silenced. In moments of grace, rare as they are, you'll be able to snatch it out, a live fish in your bare hand, pure terror. 
These are all from her first book. Two ways. From inside geometry, God looks at me and I am terrified. He makes the incubus descend on me. I yell for Mama. I hide behind the door where Papa hangs his dirty shirt. They give me sugar water to calm me. I speak the words of prayers. But there's another way. If I sense he's peeking at me, I think about brands of cigarettes. I think about a man in a red cape going out in the middle of the night to worship the Blessed Sacrament. I think about hand-rolled tobacco, train whistles, a farm woman with a basket of pekee fruit, all aroma and yellow. Before he knows it, there I am in his lap. I pull on his white beard. He throws me the ball of the world. I throw it back. Now going into later books. The Dark of Night. I'm singled out by flashes embedded in half-sleep pre-dawn Gethsemane hour. These visions are raw and clear, sometimes peaceful, sometimes pure terror, without the bone structure daylight provides. The soul descends to hell, death throws its banquet, until everyone else wakes up and I can doze. The devil eats his fill, not God, grazes on me. I guess I'm jumping around a little bit here. Um, okay, yeah. Not even one line in December. <clears throat> I never want to desire death unless out of holiness, calling it sister as St. Francis did. Almost the 25th and not one line. My hips moving back and forth and me not trying to contain the wiggle. I should have walked like this my whole life if I wanted to conquer the world. Dusky butterflies, trash, pebbles, soapy water seeping from the wet wall. Things to offer themselves up to me as I roam the neighborhood. A little girl watches from her tiled porch and not even a line. My work is important because it's all I have. In a three-bedroom house with a tired backyard, the soul keeps moaning, ah, life. The idea of suicide appears and floats past the TV antenna, but keeps coming back and not even a line. I need to confess to a man of God. I committed gluttony. I craved the details of other people's frailties. And even though I have a husband, I explored my own body. Not even one line in December, and I was born for this. My soul longs to copulate. The wise man rushed past me. The star is in hiding. It's raining torrents in Brazil. Pieces for a stained glass window. Does Japan really exist? Or any country I don't know with its parched coastline? What's between the thighs is public public and obvious. What I want is your heart, the depths of your eyes, which do everything but speak. If you look at me in Spanish, I'll snap my fingers and start dancing dressed in red. When I closed my eyes to the sun, I saw a blueprint, perfection, for only a second, and then forgot. Just as the saints existed, so does God with his unspeakable seductive power. He's the one who made gold, and gave us the discretion to invent necklaces to wear around our necks. Said like that, it's so pure, I hear, hardly see the sin in buying one myself. I've got the same desires as 30 years ago, immutable as mosquitoes in the sun-drenched kitchen, my mother making coffee, my father seated, waiting. Okay, this one I am going to read the Portuguese. <clears throat> Lily-like. I'll read the Portuguese after so you can hear that. I'm, it's, it's got a lot of sound and I'm trying to, to use that. Lily-like. Lilies, lilies, life is all mystery. I, I ruin the lilies. They confuse me. They blanket the departed, heaven's flower beds where virgins stroll. Like heads of garlic, their bulbs sit beneath the ground waiting for November to make me suffer. They grow thick like people. 
Easter lily, water lily, purple lily, yellow lily, anti-lily, lily of nothing, spirit of flower, floral breath of the world, unfinished thought of God on this October afternoon, I ask myself, what are lilies for but to torment me? A black lily is impossible. Innocent and voracious, lilies don't exist, and all this talk is delirium. Lirial, lirius, lirius, a vida só tem mistérios, destruiu os lirius, eles me põem confusa, os finados se cobram deles, os canteiros do céu onde as virgens passeiam, com cabeças de alho os bulbos ficam na terra, esperando novembro para que eu, de, eu padeça, como pessoas esta flor espessa, Branca d'água, roxo lírio, lírio amarelo, um antilírio. Lírio de nada, espírito de flor, austo floral do mundo, pensamento de Deus inconcluído, nesta tarde de outubro em que eu pergunto, para que servam os lírios, além de me atormentaram? Um lírio negro é impossível, inocente e voraz, o lírio não existe, e esta fala é de lírio. Ok. <clears throat> so, the title of this book, we use the title of a poem called Mystical Rose. The first time I was conscious of form, I said to my mother, Dona Armanda has a basket in her kitchen where she keeps tomatoes and onions. I should say that in their house, they just sort of sat in a pile on the counter, so the idea that you had a basket to put them in made them beautiful. She described, when I was first translating this poem, I sort of didn't get it. She explained it to me. <clears throat> Dona Armanda has a basket in her kitchen where she keeps tomatoes and onions, and so I began fretting that even lovely things don't last forever. Until one day I wrote, it was here in this room that my father died, here that he wound the clock and rested his elbows on what he thought was a windowsill but was the threshold of death. I saw that certain words grouped a certain way made it possible to live without the things they described. My father was coming back, indestructible. It was as if someone painted a picture of Dona Armanda's basket and said, now you can eat the fruit. There was order in the world. Where did it come from? And why does order, which is joy itself and bathes in a different light than the light of day, make the soul sad? We must protect the world from time's corrosion. We must cheat time itself. And so I kept writing. It was here in this room that my father died O oh, night, come da on down. Your blackness can't erase his memory. That was my first poem. The poet wearies. I've had in, in this poem, yours with a capital Y. <clears throat> the poet wearies. I've had it with being your herald. Everybody has a voice. Why am I the one who has to get on board with no say about where we're headed? Why not proclaim the wondrous woof of looms yourself with that voice that echoes to the four corners of the earth? The world's seen so much progress and you still insist on traveling salesmen going door to door on horseback. Check out this jackknife, people. Take a good look, ma'am. It's magic. Slices and screws, tweezers and dices. Whole set of tools in one. Dear God, let me work in the kitchen. I'm not a peddler or a scribe. Just let me make your bread. Child, says the Lord. All I eat is words. This is a poem that I... I remember caring about it when I translated it, but I never read it at readings until at the, the Griffin um, ceremony in Toronto, Robert Haas read it 
And he read it with such passion and delight that I, now I just love to read it. So thank you, Bob. Spiritual exercise. Mary, pray your son to show me God the Father. Images arrive, a man, a vignette, a musical instrument. What seems a feather fan turns out to be a cobra head. I want to see the Father, I insist. Pray your son to show me the Father. A tooth, a vulva, a bunch of turnips appear, born as I was from nothing. Mary, where do turnips come from? Where is the father? Where did I come from? A horse of sun moves on the wall. Is it the father? No, it's just a shadow already disappearing. Is the father a factory then? My father used to say, oh, father, and raise his arms reverently. Grandpa too, God our father. And he'd take off his hat. So one father leads back to another and another and yet another, and then millions of fathers later, at last to Adam, who is me, waking from a dream, just when dawn shone through, blood red and cool, daughter of a Parnassian, which so enchanted me when I was a girl, daughter of a railroad man, as exhausted now as a greengrocer at noontime. I, father, help me hawk the rest of these squash, Drum the idea of seeing Father God out of my head. Give me a smoke and some coffee. <clears throat> so two more from the book, and then I'll read a few new poems. Oops. 187, OK. St. Christopher's Transit, which is a bus company. <clears throat> Adelia is terrified of buses, and she um, was terrified of planes, too. And she, we had a couple of gigs here in the States, and the first one she canceled. It was used in Rio and having, you know, just, just couldn't get on a plane. So she, she went to a therapist to learn to get on a bus. Well, she had to go, learn to go get on a bus to go to the city to see them. And eventually, she got on planes. She still doesn't like it. St. Christopher Transit. I don't want to die ever for fear of losing the riches unwinding outside this window. Was that the pony bar, bony bar, or tony bar? Across from the train station, the feed store announces where it's from, Woodland. Reading essence in a name, we get half-truths. Because the bus stops and life doesn't. Because life is you, capital U, unnameable. My husband really likes sex, but he's also quite capable of prolonged abstinence. That guy tending his garden with a hatred so profound that he looks almost innocent means to guillotine the neighbor woman with the radiant window. Does any of this move you? An hour and a half on the road and life is so good it hurts. The fields are parched but invincible in their power to take me back. To you? To childhood? To the fatherland? To the kingdom of heaven? What can I do? This is a poem. I'm really hungry. I'd like to attend mass right here and now. Some workers give me the thumbs up. Everything grows even more peaceful. Did I fall asleep? Nodding off is so unsightly. That scientist really made me happy when he said beauty is energy. I knew this without knowing, and it's going to be a serious help. The bus stops again. Bulldozers scrape the earth ever more pure. Sure, they're knocking down trees, but ecology can wait. The power of those machines, the way they heave the trees, everyone stock still watching. It's good to see a man at heavy labor, a woman looking after her child, instruction left to the priest. I'm the same as when young, so ignorant and so smart. If the bus is running late, so what? I don't care. I went, I came back, but most of all, I want to stay right here. Okay, ex voto, which is um, in churches in Brazil and a lot of places, um, you can see tin or made of lots of different things like a leg or a heart and it's um, promises made like fix this part of me and I'll come into the church and give thanks. <clears throat> I'm simplifying that vastly, but this is the cartoon version for you. Ex voto. 
One hot, bright Sunday afternoon, I was ambushed by pressing intestines, throes of nausea and weeping. The desire to tear my hair and strip naked in the middle of my life and howl until bone dry, what do you want from me, God? Once I stopped crying, the man who sat waiting said, you're so sensitive, that's why you get short of breath which started me crying again because it was true and also a lie and therefore only half consoling. Breathe deeply, he urged. Splash some cold water on your face. Let's take a walk around the block. It's psychological. What ex voto can I bring to the cathedral if I'm not sick but still need a cure? My devout friend has turned Buddhist. I'm rooting for her to get disillusioned and go back to praying Catholic prayers with me. I could never be a Buddhist for fear of not suffering, for fear of getting all Zen. Is there really such a thing as a happy saint, or is it just the biographers who paint them as such sunny saps? The state of Minas Gerais, that's the state she lives in, which is called General Minds. The state of Minas Gerais is full of terrible things, boulders and boulders of such immediate beauty, and then buildings strung, sprung straight from hell, courtesy of the uncreator of the world. And there's that little boy who can't hang on much longer. He's going to die too weak to suck the string of dark flesh that's supposed to be a breast, lost to flies. My heart is good, but I can't believe it. My man showers me with gifts. Why am I given so much when what I deserve is solitary confinement? Words? No, I said, I can only accept weeping. So why ever did I wipe my eyes at the sight of the climbing rose bush and that other thing I didn't want? No way did I want it right then, the poem, my ex voto, not the shape of what's sick, but of what's sound in me, which I push and push away, pressed by the same force that works against the beauty of the boulders. Both God and the world are begging for love, which is why I'm richer than either one. I alone can say to the stone, you are beautiful to affliction. Just as I can say to him, you are beautiful, beautiful, so beautiful. I almost understand why I'm gasping for air. Choosing the words to describe my agony, I'm breathing easier already. Some of us God wants sick. Others, he wants writing. Okay, just uh, a couple more poems. This one is called um, Satan's Market. <clears throat> and this time I'll read the Portuguese first. Feira de Santanás. Feira de Santanás. Os peixes me olham de suas postas sangrentas. Falta modestia as frutas. De ponta a ponta barracas. Quero fugir dali, acrossado pelos tomates de inadequado esplendor. Compro dois nabos para comê-los cruz, feito uma ermita em sua horta. Não por virtude, por orgulho, talvez travestido de júbilo, que me vendeu o diabo em sua tenda de enganos. Satan's Market The fish eye me from their bloody slabs. The fruit is immodest. Vendors end to end, I want to flee, distressed by the tomatoes' indecent splendor. I buy two turnips and eat them raw, like an ascetic in his garden. It's not virtue, virtue, but pride disguised as joy the devil sold me in his tent of lies. Distractions at the wake. Philippa still warm in her coffin and what springs to mind are the pots and pans she scoured until they shined. Just because she died at the age I am now, she'll never gather dust like a fossil in a museum. Neither will her way of putting the lid on any subject. It's a problem, sister. There's the back, the baggage, and the bearing. But the bearing? How tangible is that? And if it's abstract, why does it hurt so? Philippa set up thrift sales for mothers from the fringes. 
The poor things, you have no idea. It's a problem, sister. Metaphorically speaking, Philippa is now resting in her final bed. As if I weren't mortal, I pray for her soul and act more broken up than her relatives, desperate to shake off my greed. Who's going to get that gold cross she so rarely wore? I need a retreat. My glucose is sky high. And even with a pill, it takes forever to fall asleep. Lord, have mercy. I ask because I'm alive and wild for sugar. Okay, three more poems. Anti-love. Love took on the flesh of the hours and sat between us. He was himself the seat, the air, the tone of voice. Do you truly care for me? Between question and answer, I looked at a finger, mine, the, this very one that took shape inside my mother at her expense, and which, with nowhere else to go, remains with me, obliging and needy. Where are you now, Mama? I'm so grateful, miss you so. It was a simple question, said my fiance. Why this burst of tears? Pentecost. I inherited this house, which has become, which has one room I avoid, paralyzed by its icy air. I keep to a smaller space where virtues and laughter, even a few seeds of joy remain intact, retain some life. But when I behold the massive entryway, I stiffen. Smiling devil fear has me in his lap. Child, you're very sick. Let me tend you with the salve of sleep. Like an animal who smells danger, I pray to the depths I'm made of. Like someone about to die, save me, save me. The fervor of some spirit, until then severe and unfeeling, comes to my rescue and lovingly, recovering from myself, I gently caress my sex and the name of that spirit is courage. And the last poem is called Incarnation. Powerful sweetness grips me to the bone. Zero stridency. What pulsates I can nearest call silence. Though it's just a word, an interjection, the anticipated murmur of an underground river in my mother's uterus when she was happy and my blood was her blood and her breathing my own life. When the spirit comes, it's in the body that its tongue of fire wants to rest. Thank you for your attention. And I don't know if there's time or if there are questions, but I'm happy to answer some if there are. Or try to. Yes, in the back. Not a student of poetry or translation. Really loud, so I'm not a student of poetry or translation, so forgive me if this is an ignorant question. <laughs> there are no ignorant questions. Um, I'm curious how you make decisions on, because it seems like poetry and translation would be so tricky to really capture something that's as ineffable as some of these poems seem to be. And so I'm curious, do you ever feel a rack with indecision? And Always. <laughs> How do you make the decision? Well, I'm very lucky because I sit with Adelia for hours. She complains, but she, she lives with it. <laughs> um, and I ask her questions up and down and sideways about the words themselves, about what was in her mind. Um, and so that helps me to, to find the right words because I keep searching until what I find sort of echoes with what she says. Um, and another thing is, I think the same as with writing poems, you have to let them steep for a while. So, I mean, you sometimes just feel, read it months later and, and have an idea that gets closer to where you're going. But yeah, it's, it's, 
it's a lot of indecision, um, and, and they go through many, many changes. Anybody else? Uh, would you say that the indecision involved in translation, what, 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 how do you think of the indecision involved in translation as compared to the indecision involved in your own poems? I think it's worse with my own poems because there's no rubric to follow. There's no er poem you're trying to inhabit and do justice to. So when you're writing something that could go anywhere, it's, it's yeah, I think it's even harder. There are other things that are harder about translation, but um, in terms of that, yeah, I think it's, it's freer to do your own poems and thus scarier, even scarier. Yeah, Lizzie. Uh, what are you reading right now, and what poets and translators have you been inspired by? I should have prepared for that question. <laughs> um, God, I, I, I am one of those people that has towering piles of books waiting to be read. <laughs> um, um, the most recent books that I've read and loved are Ada Limon's new book, um, which I just ate up and then started over. Um, as far as translation, um, I don't think I've read anything new lately, except I was just given a certain Italian translation by someone who's here. <laughs> because our wonderful host gave me books by all of the faculty that I get to read, so that's the next translation that I'm going to read, Jeff's book. Um, yeah, I'm, I haven't really read a lot of translations. I, my, most of my teaching is, um, I do a lot of um, generative workshops, so I have to bring poems to the students and I make prompts out of them, and so I'm always online and with piles of books reading new poems from all over the place, and my, the names are out of, have gone out of my head. If I think of any when I see you tomorrow, I'll talk about it. Anybody else? Yes. What inspired you to get into literary translation? That's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> I read a lot of translation. I didn't, didn't even know that much about it till I went to UMass to the MFA program. And the first job I had as a grad student was to help Donald Junkins work on an anthology of contemporary poetry. And I discovered it's just amazing. I mean, I, I had known Neruda, I had known some greats, but I just found so many poets, especially women poets that I hadn't known about. And um, it just opened the door to the idea of it. And I love languages. I had taken many languages in college and high school. And um, so that got me started. And I, and I took an independent study at, at, at UMass and translated some Iberian um, Peninsula Spanish poets. And I just, I mean, it was such an incredible thing to be doing. To me, it was like a, the puzzle of my heart, you know, to, to work on something that um, just is so irritatingly difficult, but so lovely to think that you're actually bringing, you know, you, it's like, you have to read this. Oh, you don't understand that language. Well, I could do this for you. I could give it to you. Um, so there, I think a lot of people who translate, that's one of the reasons is you've got to read this. So I'm going to make it possible for you to read this. And once you get started, it's kind of a wonderful addiction. Yes? I have a forming question that maybe you can finish for me. But I, I want to ask something about abstraction, which felt like it showed up in all of the poems. They're, they're full of words like spirit and courage. And, um, the question is something about how do you, for yourself, pin down such giant words like that? And when do you, I don't know, let the, let the kite string go loose and let the music go in translation in your own work? Does that make some sense? Yeah, but I don't know how to answer it. Um, <laughs> it's kind of paradoxical, isn't it? I mean, I, when I started thinking about abstractions when I was writing this book, it seemed to me that we're always told not to use them. But when you think about the list of the just today of abstractions I've mentioned, they're the core of what, what it is to be human, right? I mean, animals don't have abstract thoughts this, that we know of, right? It's, it's, it's staying alive. You have to have a little bit of leisure to think about abstractions. Um, and so 
I think they're the root of things. And the problem is when you use them and they're just a plug-in that does all the work. But if you're actually exploring what they mean, and um, then I think it's a different way of using them. And that's what I was trying to do in that book. And um, in a way, I think Adelia does that also, because she's always talking about some of the same things. Um, when she, But she's just digging around the side underneath um, when she uses them and using them in different ways sometimes. It's because the same abstraction, she can use it in a positive way and in a negative way. That, I think, makes them, that shows their use and their importance. I don't know if I've answered the question, but that's what comes to mind. You're welcome. You have another one, Lizzie? <laughs> yeah, I got another one. Uh, so, so many of us here are in the MFA program, and I'm just curious what you think about the formal study of creative writing, and how, how do we learn to become writers? That's a small All question. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know how people did it when they just sat in their little rooms and had a few friends that were writers. I mean, I, I really think that um, in a, in a, especially in a program like this that I can tell has this community that supports each other, faculty and students alike, um, to, to be with other people trying to wrap their minds around doing this thing that we do, whether it's writing or translating, makes such a difference. Um, and I mean, you're exchanging you got to read this book. I mean, it's just everything that it gives you to amplify what tools you have. Um, and after all, I mean, I can't even think about sending a poem out or showing it to anyone until people that I know and trust look at that poem and tell me what I think is there that's not really there because you, we write, we take for granted what we're talking about. And I have a group of women that we meet once uh, once a month, which also forces us to write a poem a month, which is a good thing. So it's kind of like a gym date. Um, but I also need to step out of that zone and show poems to people that don't know my life, because that group knows so much about me that, that it's almost like they're me looking at the poem. So you really need a lot of different eyes to look at your work. And, um, and different people have different things they can offer you, formal things, um, heart things, um, just what don't, what don't I see? You, you think that's there and it's not there. So to me, thank God we have this community who are all toiling in the same kitchen to, to make something worthwhile to share. Maybe that's a good place to leave it. If anyone has any other questions, just come talk to me. I'm happy to respond. Thank you. So we're going to have a signing now. Jane, will you teach us all how to do it? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all.